participants for this uh, today's this eighth day the certificate four week certificate uh, program so i uh, welcome and invite today's speaker dr chanchal devnath please thank you dr vaj for your introduction with many good words thank you very much first uh, let me share my screen screen is visible now no oh, no it's not visible i request all other participants you can start your video so that we can take uh, one group photo also you can put on your camera screen is not visible now sir no no it's not visible yeah just we will take one group photo all participants are requested please uh, please start your camera yeah Okay, Dr. Sir, continue. Thank you, thank you all. It visible now? Yes, it's visible. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Once again. Yeah. Good morning, one and all. First of all, I uh, like to thank the organizer of this four-week certificate course and inviting me and giving me an opportunity to pass some time with you. Coming to the subject, actually, fungus uh, they. Uh, <clears throat> comprise a wide area of our biodiversity. They are the highest species, highest number of species uh, shared or present on this uh, planet Earth. And when we think about fungus, uh, many, uh, most of the time, uh, we have a uh, preconceived mind that they are always bad, but it is not the thing actually. Rather, they do uh, many things good for the human being, starting from providing uh, food, like a different uh, mushroom we use to eat. Uh, it helps to prepare different kind of food and uh, beverages, like bread, then fermented for other fermented products like cheese, uh, wines, so all these things uh, uh, we uh, produce with the help of this. Uh, creatures. They also uh, provide drugs for human being like uh, we know the invention, the history of invention of penicillin, the first antibiotic. They also uh, helps in producing different kind of uh, modern vaccines like recombinant DNA vaccine. One, uh, for example, I can say that hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, to produce this vaccine, the vector used is a fungi. Besides these, uh, they also helps. The main thing they do is different substrates, whatever uh, present on this planet, the end user of those substrates are fungi and they decompose them and make prepare them again for recycling, for reusing by the other creatures. So that many, these many uh, good works they do for us continuously. And a very minimum percent of this fungi, which actually do harm for the human being, 
and we call them medically impo important fungi, but their number is very few in comparison to the total number of fungi. Mostly they are saprophytics. And among the medically important fungi, <clears throat> again, a very few are having genotic importance, of which one is dermatophytes. So my uh, today's presentation is on this diagnostic approach of this uh, fungi dermatophytes. And the whole presentation will be uh, uh, consisting of four, uh, four, uh, four different parts. The first uh, uh, part will cover uh, regarding the definition and importance of these dermatophytes, other general features of common fungus. Second part, we will cover uh, the uh, position of dermatophyte in fungal infection, their morphological characteristics, as well as their classification. In the third portion, <coughs> we will deal with the different diseases caused by dermatophytes, both in man as well as in animals. And finally, the diagnosis of the diseases caused by this fungus. Now, what is dermatophytes? Actually, they are a special kind of molds. Actually, fungus, they generally remain in <coughs> Um, nature in two forms. One is single cell form and another is multicellular form. The multicellular form is called mold and the unicellular form is called yeast. <clears throat> Dermatophytes are, uh, it comes under the molds which have the capacity to invade the keratinized tissue in man as well as in animals and causing cutaneous infections commonly referred as tinea or Ring one. Now, the name dermatophyte, if we just split this name, we will get two parts. One is called derm, that means skin, and the other part is phyte, means plants. So, literally, the term dermatophyte means it's a plant of skin. But unfortunately, <clears throat> these fungi, they are not uh, confined to stay in skin, rather its appendages also like nail and hair, and they are not fight or they are not plants also. So this is a misnomer, but still the name is continuing since uh, antiquity because no other name uh, has been proposed. Now, if we think uh, and if we compare that uh, this fungi with which plants or animals they uh, simulate more, then we will find that they <clears throat> are more similar in different aspects, more similar or close to the animal side, not in the plant side. But our common sense always uh, prevails uh, or tells us that it is closer to the plant, but that is actually not the fact. <coughs> now, <coughs> These facts, few facts that uh, I have mentioned here, it will definitely uh, helps us to understand how important these dermatophytes are, at least in the present world, when we are using uh, different kinds of uh, drugs, when a majority of our population is immunocompromised, <laughs> then uh, it, it is coming up as a very as a very important infect, infective agent. Now, dermatophytosis, it's, a cos, it's called cosmopolitan in distribution and about 145 countries, they are reporting the presence of the disease, including India. And it is assumed that one fifth of the world population is affected with this disease at, a, at any point of time. Interestingly, the highest number of the dermatophyte infections is caused by contact with animals and their incidences are increasing with the growing popularity of keeping companion animals at home. We are seeing that uh, it's a growing, it is a growing trend that people are keeping more and more pets, even uh, multiple kinds of pets they are keeping at a time. So that is a very good source of this infection. They can infect both immunocompetent as well as immunocompromised individuals. But 
the pattern of infection it varies in case of immunocompetent individuals they generally affect the skin nail and the hair whereas in immunocompromised individuals they can affect any organ even they can uh, produce the systemic diseases also now the prevalence of dermatophyte infection it is increasing from year to year whereas the practical diagnostic options are still very limited so it's very important uh, a disease like we can say now regarding the before uh, we understand or we go for the diagnosis of uh, this dermatophytes we should uh, understand actually the different features of fungi general features of fungi fungi mostly they are eukaryotic they may be unicellular or multicellular as i mentioned earlier they have a very rigid cell wall and one important component of this cell wall is chitin this chitin is very important uh, for diagnosing the organism uh, we will uh, discuss in um, our later uh, part of this presentation where this chitin is used as a diagnostic tool the cell membrane of this fungi is also uh, a fungi is also having the bipolar layer lipid layer but in between this bipolar lipid layer there is the presence of some argosterol molecules which is different from that of the animal cells and this argosterol molecule is very much important from the therapeutic aspect of this fungal diseases because uh, the drugs most most of the drugs that we use to treat the fungal diseases they target this molecule because this molecule is absent in animal cells whereas it is present in fungal cell wall a cell uh, membrane uh, component now uh, they are heterotrophic like uh, the animals they also need the exogenous energy source they cannot produce their own uh, food they do not have any chlorophyll they are not susceptible to usual antimicrobials so antibiotics they generally do not work on then reproduction by both sexual as as well as asexual means but the asexual form is mostly seen they may be monomorphic that is uh, either in the yeast form or in the mold form but some of the fungi are also there who exhibit the dimorphism means they can exit the same, same fungus it can be either unicellular or in uh, multicellular that is also possible these are the some general features of fungi <clears throat> now for diagnosing the fungal diseases knowing the different cellular components of a fungus is very important because these these are the main things that guide us to make a pinpoint diagnosis of a fungal species here in, in this picture is actually uh, i have uh, collected which is actually universal fungal cell picture but no singular single fungus exhibits all the features in itself so whatever features uh, that different fungus uh, they uh, just uh, show all have been put together to form this universal fungal cell for better understanding of different structures now the most important structure here is the this tubular structures as you can see i think these are the tubular structures which are just like the hose of our garden hose pipe of our garden uh, these are called hyphae they are very important for diagnosing the fungal cells or fungal species this hyphae it may be of different kinds sometimes between these tubular structures there are some transverse uh, partitions which are called septi and when an hyphae is having this kind of septi they are called septed hyphae the lower fungus they generally produce non septed hyphae whereas the higher group they produce septed hyphae 
again some of the hyphae they do not have any color natural pigments they are called hyaline hyphae they are white in color without any color hyaline hyphae whereas some other fungi they can produce pigmented hyphae sometimes some yeast like fungi like candida albicans they produce a kind of uh, this is not the true hyphae they actually they reproduce by budding and when they start budding they continuously uh, goes on uh, this uh, budding process and produce a kind of uh, structure which also looks like the hyphae but they are not actually the hyphae that's why they are called pseudo hyphae so one hyphae it's having so many types septed hyphae posi septed hyphae uh, non septed hyphae then pseudo hyphae so all these structures uh, help us to diagnose which species that you have isolated maybe the second important um, uh, components of the fungal cells are the asexual spores they generally produce this kind of spores for asexual reproduction and these spores help us to diagnose different species of fungi um, um, in a better way because different species of fungi produce different kinds of these asexual spore or conidia they are they are called conidia some are unicellular among these conidia which we use to say uh, microconidia and some are multicellular that we use to say macroconidia here i think you can see in the left side a big conidia that is macroconidia here you can see a good number of small small dot like structures these are microconidia and the conidia which is uh, uh, developed on an elongated structure that is called conidiophores again some of the spores which generally fungus produce when they are in a stress condition they are devoid of any uh, nutrition or some other environmental stress then they produce a special kind of spores which are big in size and which protects them for, uh, from the environmental stress that kind of conidia is known as chlamydospores so all these structures uh, which are uh, very much important for diagnosing the fungal uh, species uh, are there now when we grow these uh, dermatophytes on a um, uh, artificial media these hyphae they start uh, branching and a network of branching is known as mycelia you can see these tubular structures crisscrossing uh, and producing a kind of network of this hyphae so this network of hyphae is known as mycelia which is another important diagnostic feature for this uh, fungal pathogen Now, coming to the second part of uh, our presentation, here I will say, where actually this dermatophyte, it belongs among the different fungal infections. And uh, also the morphology as well as the classification of these dermatophytes. First, the position of these dermatophytes in fungal infection. If we consider the different kinds of fungal infections, we will see that they are broadly categorized in five categories. The first one is the superficial fungal infection, where only the outermost layer of the skin and hair is involved. The second is cutaneous, the deeper epidermis as well as hair and nail involved in this kind of infections. Then subcutaneous, primarily the subcutaneous tissue as well as the lymphatic vessels are involved. Systemic, here the infection usually originates from lung and then it is spread in many par other parts of the body. And finally, the opportunistic means they generally do not produce any disease in immunocompetent individuals. But when an individual, by any means, his or her immune system uh, depressed or suppressed, then they flare up. Like candidiasis, cryptococcosis, they uh, comes under this group opportunistic fungal infections. Now, our dermatophyte, they falls within the cutaneous group. And mostly their infection is limited within the epidermis layer of the skin. 
particularly involving the stratum corneal. Now, to tell about the classification of dermatophytes, it has been found that these organisms, since its uh, um, discovery uh, about 1840 uh, or like this, uh, many people, they have uh, uh, classified these schemes and uh, which is uh, very much complicated uh, also uh, to uh, remember all these kinds of uh, classification schemes, but two among them which are uh, widely recognized and researchers they use to uh, use these two classifications. That is, uh, the first one is the Emmons classification, which came uh, its, into its existence in 1934, where Amon classified all the dermatophytes uh, on the basis of the conidial morphology. The conidia that I was telling in the previous slide that they can be of two kinds, macro as well as the microconidia. So, on the basis of the morphology of this conidia produced by the dermatophytes, Amon classified all the dermatophytes into three distinct genera. The first one is the trichophyton, second, microsporum, and third one is the epidermo. Python. And within this genera, different species are also there. The second kind of classification, which uh, again uh, is very much popular, is the classification of dermatophytes according to their normal habitat. Means uh, where actually in the eco ecosystem, these dermatophytes usually prefer to stay, prefer to proliferate. So on the basis of that, this ecological classification is also having three groups of dermatophytes. One is geophilic, means they are mostly found on, in soil. Geophilic means they infect living animals. And anthropophilic means they uh, generally infect uh, on human. Among the anthropophilic, trichophyton rubrum, trichophyton transurans, Echinococcus, uh, sorry, echi uh, Epidermophyton coccosum, these are very important uh, species. Among the geophilic group who generally uh, causes diseases in animals are Microsporum canis, Trichophyton metagrophytis, Trichophyton verrucosum are important. And uh, the geophilic fungi, Microsporum gypsum, is an example. Now, after those 13 classifications, very recently in 2011, the Amsterdam Declaration of the Fungal Nomenclature, they also came up with a different kind of uh, this uh, classification on the basis of the uh, multilocus genetic analysis of the isolates, uh, where they classified them or they uh, grouped them in nine clades. You can see uh, in the left hand side all the nine clades trichophyton, epidermophyton, nanigia, microsporum, paraphyton, then lophophyton, as well as the orthoderma. But among these uh, nine clades, you can very well see that most of the geophilic and the uh, anthropophilic dermatophytes they fall in the two clades that is trichophyton and epidermophyton. And the other seven clades, they mainly consist of different kinds of geophilic fungi. Now, regarding the morphology of these dermatophytes, because this is very important for uh, from diagnostic point of view, but before going the actual morphology of these dermatophytes, we need to understand that the colony dermatophytes, what types of colony they generally produce. Unlike the bacterial colonies that we see in microbiology lab, the bacterial colonies, they are very small, small, and they remain uh, um, many in numbers uh, in the petri dishes. Fungal colonies, they develop as a big colony, and almost one colony is just uh, covering the whole plate. So in the, this, this is the difference uh, mainly in the morphology of the fungal and bacterial colonies. But the thing is that this dermatophytes, they can produce three different kinds of colonies. The texture of colonies different and it depends that I was telling this mycelium is having a very good role uh, in the identification of the fungal colony or fungal species because the pattern of mycelium growth 
actually determines what kind of colony the species is going to produce. When these mycelia, they are not at all aerial and they grow very closely attached with the surface of the media, then the first kind of colony developed that is called the membranous form of colony means this colony looks like a thin layer of skin because the mycelium they are not aerial they are not uh, getting up from the surface of the uh, media that's why they are called membranous form the second form is the filamentous form where actually huge amount of aerial growth of the mycelium is seen and that's why the colony looks like cottony fluffy hairy, velvety, or woolly. Different micro, different species of dermatophytes like epidermophyte and plocosum, microsporum, odoni, canis, distortum, many of the dermatophytes, most uh, means the maximum number of dermatophytes, they produce this kind of colonies, filamentous colonies. Whereas the another third type of colony is the granular or powdery form of the colony because they sporulate much. And the spores are small, small ball-like structures. That's why the, the colony they produce looks like granular or powdered. So these three kinds of colonies. So whenever you are judging or you are just uh, looking for the gross morphology of the colony or macroscopic morphology of the colony, first of all, you need to find out the pattern of growth of the mycelium, which will guide you for further identification. Now, generally, the dermatophyte morphology, it is uh, de determined or it is judged by two ways. One is macromorphology and another is micromorphology. Macromorphology means the kind of colony they have developed, its shape, its color that it produced in the media, both, both front side as well as in reverse side. Then its nutritional requirement because some of the dermatophytes they need special kind of uh, nutrients for their growth which again helps us to uh, uh, determine what uh, or else helps us for their identification the texture of the colony i have already mentioned in our uh, previous slide that this texture may be of three kinds it may be the, that um, uh, yeah membranous filamentous or granular and rate of growth also it also because all the dermatophytes they do not grow same speed some are slow grower some are very slow grower for example the trichophyte and verrucosum which is actually the cattle sheep goat these uh, species they generally um, uh, are infected by these uh, uh, species trichophyte and verrucosum it needs a long time incubation even your media uh, uh, cracks because it dried up for this long time incubation. So it is a very slow grower. So by seeing the, this rate of growth, also we can understand what species it could, could be. Now the micromorphology, another important side for diagnosing the fungal species, uh, particularly the dermatophyte species, and in this micromorphology, what we do, we take small amount of culture and we stain it with uh, that lactophenol cotton blue we'll see under the microscope to see different micro structures like the conidia, macroconidia, microconidia, its shape, its um, uh, uh, presentation, its arrangement, uh, and everything. So uh, besides, uh, besides the conidia, the uh, hyphae also guide us to uh, identify a particular species of the dermatophyte. Now, if we consider in uh, just in detail uh, regarding the uh, this uh, microstructures, particularly the conidias, then we will see that there are diff definitely uh, dif differences are there in the pattern of the conidia they produce. For example, in case of the genus Epidermophyton, the macroconidia are broadly clubbed. You can see in the left uh, side brick picture, these epidermophyton macroconidia, they are very broad in their end with typically smooth, thin to moderately thick walls. The walls are thin or moderately thick and uh, 
within them septation is there these are the septations and the microconidia the thing is that in case of epidermophyton you will get no microconidia there is no microconidia the real picture we will see in uh, next uh, few slides so the thing epidermophyton it may be an isolate of epidermophyton when we understand when we find there is no microconidia and the macroconidia that is present is clavet shape means the end is blunt they are septed and uh, they remains generally three at a time more, not never it is more than three it may be less than three but never it is more than three are attached at a single point uh, of of the hyphae so that is another important feature for diagnosing epidermophyton in case of microsporum the macroconidia it will be spindle shaped means both the ends are tapered and the middle part is uh, wide as well as the uh, membrane is very thick and uh, the membrane is having dentation it is having the spikes it is not smooth it is thick with dentations and shape or taper, tapering shape spindle shape and regarding microconidia, it may be present or may not be present, but in most of the time they remain present, but very few in number. Whereas in trichophyton, you will get the macroconidia very less, means the big side multicellular conidia very less in number. If you find they looks like pencil or cigar shaped very long, slender, they are also having a very thin wall without any dentation. But mostly we identify trichophytons by the presence of huge number of microconidias. These microconidias and their arrangement, as well as the hyphal pattern, they develop guide us for diagnosing as a trichophyton. Now in third part of the lecture, it comprises of the diseases caused by dermatophytes, both in man as well as the animal. The basic uh, thing or basic difference between the disease in man and animal is that the name of the disease that produced in man is known as tinea, and this tinea is again named differently on the basis of the site of infection on the body. When it is on face, we used to tell it tinea uh, fasci. When it is on scalp, we used to call it tinea capitis. So like this, but in animal side, this kind of nomenclature is not in use. Starting with the diseases they produce in man, first of all, we, uh, it, it, it is important to say that all the kind of that uh, dermatophytes, it may be zoophilic, it may be geophilic or anthropophilic, all can produce infection in man. But the severity of the infection varies. And uh, mostly, the zoo, it, it is very important from genetic point of view because the zoophilic dermatophytes, who generally produce diseases in animals, in the animals, they do not produce. Uh, um, much um, symptoms, but when they are causing infection in human, in human they produce huge uh, infection. They produce uh, a severe kind of inflammatory reaction. Now, when the disease in man is on scalp, it is tinea capitis. Now, again, the type of dermatophyte involved on the basis of that, the disease varies. Some are called carrion, some are called black dot ringworm, some are favors, some are scaly ringworm, and it varies upon the type of or kind of uh, this uh, tini, uh, yeah, dermatophyte species involved. Some of the species of dermatophytes, they can penetrate the hair shaft, and if that kind of dermatophytes are causing infection in scalp, then what they do within the hair shaft, they produce huge number of conidia, and ultimately the hair uh, breaks and, uh, and leaving a small black dot uh, at the base of the hair. 
that kind of dermatophyte uh, fight, uh, means uh, uh, kinia capitis is known as black dot ringworm. When there is a very severe inflammatory reaction, then this kind of carrion calci is produced. Sometimes huge, uh, due to the huge inflammatory reaction, different um, uh, inflammatory chemicals, they oozes out and after drying, they produce a kind of crust on the surface of the um, uh, that uh, uh, skull, uh, resulting in the formation of this kind of favors. Okay. So it depends Must up. Uh, sorry. Okay. Now, this, uh, another kind is the tinea facie, when the infection is on face, but non bearded part of the face, when it involves the bearded part or the moustache, then we got tinea barbi. When uh, there is the involvement of the glabrous, uh, uh, usually the trunk, shoulder, limbs, etc. Excuse me, sir. Then it is called All the participants they are requested to keep their mic mute. Don't talk in between. Please. Then tinea axillary is also. Sir, please there. continue. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you. When uh, it is uh, uh, in the axillary region, then tinea cruris also there uh, when the infection uh, involves the perianal or perineal region or upper thigh region. Uh, the pictures are also there. You can see very well different kinds of tinea which is present in man. When it is on hands, then we call it tinea manam. When it is on pedis, uh, sorry, when it is on foot, then it is um, uh, called uh, the tinea pedis or athletes foot also used to use this term. Tinea anguium when it is in nails. Another name is used also, tineasis of nail, uh, sorry, tinea anguina, that is uh, onychomycosis. But this onychomycosis also involves uh, uh, dermatophytes as well as some other uh, fungi also and bacteria also. Now, regarding the disease uh, they produce in animals, it has been found that all the animals, they may be the domestic animal, they may be the pet, farm animal, or any other that uh, wild animal, free ranging, or that, that synanthropic animals, all the animals, uh, all the sp uh, spectra of um, animals, they usually suffer from this disease. So when in cattle, mostly we um, um, see that uh, this uh, trichophyte and verucosum species is very, very uh, common. Although some other species like mentagrophytes, they also can produce infection in cattle. In case of horse, mostly the microsporum equinum is involved um, and uh, also microsporum canis, gypsium, trichophyte and metagrophytes, trichophyte and verucosum also. Infection uh, mostly uh, involves the part uh, which remain in contact with the saddles. Uh, that part is more prone to infection. Now, ringworm in uh, camel. As camel, they generally uh, remain uh, in some different uh, environmental condition with elevated temperature. The species of dermatophytes generally recovered from camel are also different. Uh, but sometimes uh, trichophyte and mentagrophytes or microsporum canis, they also can produce infection in camels. Now, in case of pig, the type of species is microsporum nanum. They generally uh, adapted with this species of animal, but trichophyte and mentagrophytes, microsporum particular or canis are also uh, isolated from pigs. But one thing is important here to mention that generally hair of the uh, pig, uh, it, it is not infected by dermatophytes, only skin infection is there. In case of monkey, like human uh, monkey also, um, uh, they also suffer from the disease. Sheep and goat, mostly like cattle, this dermato, uh, yeah, trichophyte and verucosum is the main species that produce disease in uh, sheep and goats. In case of cat, dermatophytosis in, in cat is very important because among the all domestic and uh, farm or other um, animals, uh, uh, pet animals, cat is the only animal which asymptomatically carry this pathogen. They generally do not uh, show uh, much inflammatory reaction, but they are the usual carrier of the organism. So 
uh, we should be um, very careful when we are just mingling with our pets uh, if it is a cat. Uh, from cat, uh, Microsporum canis, trichophyte, and mentagrophytes. And from dog, also uh, all these species of dermatophytes uh, have been isolated. In poultry, also they produce disease, but uh, generally, no other parts of the body. Generally, the combs and wattles are affected, and the type species is Microsporum gallini. Whereas from rabbit, trichophyte and mentagrophytes, and from rodents, also trichophyte and mentagrophytes are mostly recovered. In case of wild animals, we see that many wild animals, they also carry the organism uh, on the surface of their body and even they produce the disease also. And mostly trichophyte and mentagrophytes, microsporum canis and microsporum gypsum have been isolated from them. But from herbivorous wild animals like uh, uh, our deer and all these things, uh, trichophyte and verrucosum is also common. Now, coming to the last part of uh, today's lecture, we will tell about the diagnostic uh, options of this uh, important fungal uh, genosis. Mostly uh, for diagnosing, uh, we are still relying upon the phenotypic identification of the organisms, but nowadays different molecular uh, identification techniques are also in place, but uh, it has been um, uh, reported many times that uh, the molecular identification, its uh, reliability and its uh, specificity uh, is not um, up to the mark in many times because sometimes it has been uh, found that two dermatophytes, they are uh, uh, just um, uh, showing the similarity uh, in molecular identification, but ecologically they are totally different. They have adapted uh, two different species of animals and producing different kinds of infection. Uh, so, this kind of things are also very common. Now, regarding phenotypic identification, which is still the gold standard for diagnosing of uh, these dermatophytes, first of all, we need to collect the sample from the suspected animal. So, before uh, collecting the sample, uh, what we do, we generally use the, uh, take the help of the, uh, that wood lamp, because mm -hmm. some of the, um, you know, some of the dermatophytes, specifically the microsporum canis and microsporum oduni, they fluoresce when ultraviolet um, uh, ray uh, um, is um, uh, exposed on them. So, uh, it helps to um, collect the um, good sample uh, from the individuals. Now, after collecting the sample, what we do, we generally first uh, do some microscopy to have some idea whether the fungal elements are there or not. And after that, the other portion of the sample, we uh, goes for fungal culture. And if within that culture, we get any um, significant growth, which is uh, uh, means characteristic for uh, any fungal elements, then we go for further uh, diagnosis by uh, its macroscopic as well as the microscopic um, uh, examination uh, through a definite uh, procedure. And again, uh, if, uh, if it is not able to uh, uh, produce some conclusive uh, uh, idea about the identification of the organism, then we use some uh, other tests also uh, that help us to or guide us to uh, make some concrete diagnosis. First of all, regarding the collection of sample, the woods lamp I have uh, I already told, this kind of fluorescence generally develops when uh, the species involved is a microsporum canis or oduni. Now, collection of sample is very tricky because uh, we all know that disease is also called ringworm. Why this name ringworm came? Because the lesions uh, looks like rings and uh, um, there, is, there is a definite scientific reason for that because the, when the infection starts at a certain uh, point, then the organism, actually the dermatophytes, they themselves do not produce any pathogenesis, rather the metabolites, the secret on the site of infection, uh, that metabolites actually uh, triggers the, uh, that uh, inflammatory reaction. And when inflammatory reaction starts, the organism, uh, the, uh, there is an elevation of temperature 
uh, and this temperature actually dermatophytes they do not like so they escape that area and they start proliferate surrounding areas and when the inflammatory reaction again starts at that point they again proliferate leave the area and so leaving centrally the sterile part the organisms generally remain at the periphery of the lesion and thereby produce a ring, a ring shaped lesion that's why they are called ringworm so during collection of sample you need to collect the sample from the active lesions means active part of the lesion that is the periphery of the lesions so generally for collection of skin samples we use a sterile forcep and scrap the area uh, uh, at the right angle of the um, border of the lesion uh, and uh, before that we need to um, clean the area uh, both uh, removing the debris and all these things as well as by applying the 70% alcohol because the 70% alcohol will help to reduce the bacterial load of the of your sample so all these things are there all these precautions you need to take before you collect a good sample uh, uh, so, so that the recovery or isolation uh, chances uh, increase from the sample uh, now after uh, collection of the sample uh, first of all what we do is the direct microscopic examination means we take a small amount of the sample on a glass slide and we uh, place few drops of 10 to 20 percent potassium hydroxide solution this potassium hydroxide solution uh, the concentration depends upon the type of the sample if it is a skin sample then soft tissue so you need a very less concentration means 10 percent if it is a hard tissue means if it is a hair or a uh, nail sample then you, you need a higher concentration about 25 percent actually this KOH, it digests the uh, tissue of the host, uh, keeping uh, intact the fungal elements. And uh, uh, after uh, applying this KOH solution, we should keep it for 32 oh, minutes to one hour. And uh, after that, we uh, uh, see under the microscope and we will find this kind of fungal elements, this hyphae, this hyphae, oh. separate hyphae, as well as some arthroconidia also is seen, which we can see under the microscope. In case of hair, we can see this kind of spores. It may be uh, at the outer surface of the hair, when it is outer surface of the hair, we call it the ectothrix hair invasion. When it is inside the shaft, then endothrix hair invasion. But nowadays, this, uh, this direct microscopy with KOH, there are some alternative options are also nowadays, like we can use the NOH with glycerol, we can use the uh, dimethyl sulfoxide. We can use some fluorescent dye also because they increases the uh, specificity as well as the sensitivity of the test. And this fluorescent dye, actually, I was telling the cell wall content of the dermatophytes, the chitin. This chitin actually binds with, um, uh, sorry, these uh, dyes, they actually bind with this chitin. And uh, when light uh, fell on them, they fluoresce. So it helps uh, uh, for better diagnosis of this organism. But this direct microscopic examination only tells us about the presence or absence of the fungus. It cannot tell us what species of fungus is there. So for that, we need to go for further uh, diagnosis by isolation of the organisms. For isolation, the sample that we have collected, we need to put them in two different sets of media. One is very common media. We know um, the name of this media. We all know that is Shabra dextrose agar. But one supplement is used here, which is called CC supplement, actually. One is uh, C for uh, that um, coram penical and C for cyclohexamide. These two supplements are used to uh, arrest the growth of the bacteria as well as the growth of the saprophytic fungi, means other fungi. So, after putting, uh, um, preparing the media, putting, uh, uh, after inoc uh, inoculation, we need to uh, have a long time incubation. So that is the difference for culturing bacteria uh, from fungi. Here, we need a long time incubation period. Uh, before one month, means four weeks, we cannot negate a sample that uh, it is uh, not having any dermatophytes. So at least for one month, we need to incubate it. 
and the incubation temperature is very low. It is um, in case of bacteria, we generally use 37 degrees centigrade for different bacteria, but here it is 30 degrees centigrade. Even some species grow uh, low at lower temperatures uh, also. Only one species is there that is Trichophyton verrucosum. It requires higher temperature that's 37 degrees centigrade for its growth. And after this culture, if your culture is positive, then this kind of growth you will get in your plate, circular uh, big size colonies. The other media is generally used is the dermatophyte test media. It is actually, it reducing the time of that one month. Actually, this media is uh, grown in a way, it's having the same components of that uh, subroid dextrose agar. Only thing is that, Dermatophyte, they, produ they produce some alkaline metabolites. And one um, that indicator is added in this dermatophyte test medium, which actually, when these metabolites are produced, uh, changes the color of the media. And uh, by seeing this, and it happens within 10 days, and within 10 days, we can say if there is a change of the color, then we can say, yes, the sample uh, contain uh, dermatophytes. But this media is not foolproof because uh, many false positive as well as false negative reactions are also given by some other uh, fungus. So that's why, uh, although it helps us, but it is not definite that uh, um, the sample is containing dermatophytes. Now here you can say the macroscopic morphology of different dermatophytes that we have isolated in our lab only. Uh, you can see um, the, the both uh, front view as well as the reverse view. So uh, both the view you need to judge uh, because you need to judge everything, the texture, the size, the growth rate, the uh, means uh, pigmentation, uh, everything you need to judge uh, for giving a particular, for giving the idea about this species. For example, you can see here the, uh, this red color uh, pigmentation. It is very, uh, uh, means indicative that the isolate is a trichophyte and rubrum because the name rubrum comes uh, mean uh, red and uh, the yellow color this kind of brown center as well as the yellowish tinge outside this is indicative of that uh, your uh, microsporum canis again this kind of furrow in the front view you can see this kind of lines this furrow is indicative of epidermophyte and flocosa so these are the different uh, the, so many criteria that uh, guide you to uh, reach uh, in a definite conclusion about the uh, identity of the isolate that you have with you. Now, this uh, macroscopic morphology, many a time they are not uh, again uh, very much concrete uh, to say that yes, that isolate is of that species. So then uh, for, the, for, for further identification, we need to go for this microscopic observation. And uh, the micro in my under microscope, these kind of things are we generally see. If here in the right side, uh, you can see uh, these are the macroconidia. Now they are spindle shaped, but spindle shaped macroconidia is produced by microsporum canis and in microsporum gypsum also. Then how we can differentiate? The differentiating point is that the end of the free end of the macroconidia is uh, it looks like the beak of a bird. So this kind of thing when is there, then you are definite that it is a microsporum canis. Whereas in case of microsporum gypsum, the end is blunt, little bit blunt, but no, not like the blunt of that epidermophyton. In case of epidermophyton, you see in this slide, there is no microconidia, only the macroconidia are there and they are club shaped. So you, you are definite that it is an isolate of uh, epidermophyton flocosum. In case of trichophyte and rubrum, you can see here in the left side, uh, the, <coughs> the uh, below one, the microconidia, they uh, are TR shaped, TR shaped, and they are arranged on the high feet, just like the, just like uh, balloons are knotted uh, uh, on a thread. So this kind of appearance uh, will help you to guide uh, uh, to say that uh, this, this may be a trichophyton uh, rubrum along with your ma ma macromorphology that you have already seen that this red color colony pigmentation is there. Now trichophyton um, uh, metagrophytes, this kind of hyphal arrangement, 
no other dermatophyte will show you this kind of hyphal arrangement, which we say spring like hyphal arrangement. In next slide, also you will see this is spring like hyphae. It only you will get in trichophyton metagrophytes. Now, verucosum again, <clears throat> the macroconidia, their sizes are a little bit big and they are also arranged on both the sides like the balloons. And uh, at the same time, the verucosum in uh, uh, grow, growth pattern also, you will see very slow growth and as well as it requires 37 degrees centigrade for its growth. So all these things um, will ultimately help you uh, to uh, reach in a final conclusion about the identity of the uh, isolate. But still, Due to this micro and macro morphological um, characteristics, you uh, may remain confused about the actual identity because you see may, maybe the rubrum they are not producing the color, so it will it may produce the confusion with the trichophyte and mentagrophytes. Now this one test is there. There are so many other like uh, similar tests. That hair perforation test. Here we test whether the fungus is able to penetrate the shaft of the hair. This test is performed by taking the sterile hair from the uh, young uh, uh, babies uh, and that um, uh, within the sterile media, both fungal cultures are added. Now, if uh, the fungus is able to penetrate the hair shaft, like this kind of penetration you can see, then we say it's definitely a dermatophyte, uh, sorry, trichophyte and mentagrophytes because rubrum, they cannot penetrate the hair shaft. Likewise, uh, different nutritional requirements uh, also um, can help us to differentiate the closely uh, means morphologically related dermatophytes. For example, the microsporum canis as well as the microsporum oduni. So they uh, simulate in um, almost all aspects of micromorphology as well as the macromorphology. But to uh, the reach in a final conclusion, if we grow them on this rice grain media, then we will see that only canis, they will grow in this media. The oduni, they cannot grow in rice grain. Likewise, um, uh, other nutritional requirement differences are also there in different uh, uh, dermatophytes. Nowadays, before it was not um, available commercially, but nowadays this media is also available. That is trichophyte and agar media. Seven media are there for identification of different trichophyte and species because they do have different kinds of selection for different uh, nutrients. For example, this uh, trichophyte and verugosum, they need thiamine as well as the inositol. For example, trichophyte and magnini, they require histidine. So accordingly, this media have uh, prepared. So your isolate, you need to put in all the seven medias and as per the growth pattern, you will definitely be able to identify which species is that that you have isolated. That, 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 that was the uh, phenotypic part of identification or diagnosis of dermatophytes. In molecular identification nowadays, uh, different techniques are used but uh, whatever technique we use first of all we need to extract the genomic dna we can extract this from the culture that we already uh, isolated there also we can we can also uh, extract the dna uh, from the uh, that uh, sample itself means the skin scrapings that you have collected from there also you can extract the dna besides different commercially available uh, ready kits are also uh, there. Mostly the thermal shock uh, uh, that uh, procedure is used for uh, separation of DNA, extraction of DNA. After extraction, we may go for uh, direct PCR, simple PCR for diagnosis, multiplex PCR by using different primers at a time. Then uh, uh, RFLP also we can uh, do for judging the segments. So uh, different options are there. And, uh, and these are the target areas mainly on the basis of which the primers have been uh, developed. This ITS means uh, internal transcribed spacer region. So these regions are very variable. So they don't, that's, that portion is targeted for identification of different species. Different kinds of primers are nowadays available. 
uh, even the species uh, specific primers are also available. You can see so many species spe specific primers. They have been uh, used and uh, their findings have been published in our lab. Also, we have used few of them. Um, it and uh, it gives good results also. So all these things uh, we can do in uh, this molecular part. Finally, I just like uh, to mention the therapeutic management of this disease. Dermatophytes, mostly the therapy, uh, uh, one is the uh, topical application of different uh, antifungal agents. Second is systemic application. Now it depends upon which portion of your body is affected. If you are suffering from tinea corporis, manum, uh, then pruris or pedis means all are superficial infections of the skin. So we generally use uh, topical uh, antifungal agents. In case of tinea, angiam means nail usually requires oral treatment with terbinafine or glaciofalvin. Tinea capitis also it um, requires the systemic application because the infection goes up to the uh, root here, um, means uh, up to the hair follicles. So topical application many a times it uh, does not reach up to that level to act on the dermatophyte. So you require again the systemic um, application. Tinea pedis is usually treated with topical medicines. Antibiotics may sometimes be necessary to prevent or uh, uh, to take care of the secondary bacterial infections. In, ca in case of animals, the same things are applied as like human, but the only thing is that uh, the practical considerations many a time limit the use of the systemic antifungals because for a large um, cattle, it requ you require a huge dose and uh, the treatment uh, that uh, regimen is also lengthy. The optimal treatment in a small animals is combined tropical as well as systemic treatment. Systemic antifungals are rarely used in large animals due to the cost of these drugs and the typically self-limited nature of the disease. Some animals such as cattle, they develop thick crusts, which should be removed by gentle brushing. And after that, in case of large animals, application of 2% tincture iodine solution, after the removal of crusts, it gives good results. It has been uh, reported by some workers. Now for prevention, you need to take the hygienic measures to prevent the introduction of dermatophytes into herds or kennels, newly acquired animals should be isolated and they should be cultured. Wild rodents control can decrease the exposure of trichophyte and mentagrophytes. Some organisms can be acquired by contact with infected soil. To prevent infected animals from transmitting dermatophytes to others, they should be isolated until the infection has resolved. The premises should be cleaned and disinfected with 3% formalin. So 3% formalin is good for removal from the non-animate surfaces. Some environments may be difficult or impossible to decon decontaminate completely. Uh, animals that have in contact with the patient should be checked for asymptomatic infections. Some veterinarians, they use topical applications prophylactically for in-contact animals. Now, dermatophytes can be difficult to eradicate from the environment, such as kennels, catteries, and animal shelters. Successful treatment of these premises must be based on the good environmental control, as well as treatments of symptomatically, as well as the asymptomatic infected animal. Now, vaccination. Uh, vaccines are available in some countries for certain organisms, such as trichophyte and verucosum, trichophyte and mentagrophytes in livestock, farmed foxes, clinicians, uh, sorry, chinchillas and rabbits. Trichophyton equinum in horses and M. canis in cats and dogs. In some countries, vaccine have been even used in dermatophyte eradication campaigns for cattle. For example, in Norway, there is a program to eradicate trichophyton verucosum from cattle hearts by vaccination, disinfection of contaminated stables, isolation of infected animals, and good hygiene. Some examples also there, success stories are also there. In one region of Norway, where 95% of the hearts they participated. The prevalence of the cattle ringworm decreased from 70% to 0% over a period of eight years. In the former Soviet Union, also a vaccination campaign reduced the prevalence of trichophyte and verucosum in cattle to less than 1% by 1984. So vaccine options are also there. Different kinds of vaccines are available. Uh, mostly they are the inactivated vaccines uh, as the vaccine component, mainly those uh, mycelium as well as the uh, conidia, they are used and uh, some of the vaccines are also uh, 
working uh, good but uh, many vaccines uh, they um, uh, are not able to prevent the disease at all but uh, they can reduce the severity of the infection these are the references finally i like to say that uh, medical mycology uh, iceberg means uh, the uh, amount of uh, disease present in a population is uh, most of the time is not actually uh, measured properly like the tip of the iceberg the amount that we see we are seeing that portion maybe uh, maybe not uh, obviously a huge portion is um, unseen to us but as because the number of the immunocompromised uh, patients are increasing day by day because you know this dermatophyte previously it was not there um, it means it was not able to uh, produce any kind of systemic uh, diseases but nowadays it is being reporting that uh, systemic uh, involvement is also there, particularly in those individuals who are immunocompromised. So persons who are actually having the infection and who are actually suffering from the disease, many a time they are neglecting. They are not um, uh, diagnosing the disease. They are not going for the diagnosis of the disease as well as treating the disease. And uh, um, a long time, if a pathogen is uh, there with the host, then uh, maybe uh, some changes may happen in the um, organism which uh, may increase its virulence. So it's a, a very important uh, to diagnose all the uh, affected individuals and uh, uh, to take the proper treatment uh, for, uh, for the betterment, uh, for uh, better management of the disease in future. And with this, I conclude uh, my speech. Thank you all. If you are having any question, you are free to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chanchal Devnath, for wonderful uh, presentation. Very recent, updated information you have uh, given on your talk that is on recent diagnostic approach for zoonotic dermatophytes. And as you have mentioned that the one-fifth of the world population is affected with dermatophytes. So this is very alarming situation and particularly the immunocompromised and immunosuppressed patients are more affected so all should be very much aware and all the details about the starting from the classifications morphology and the prevention control measure as well as the vaccination part you have covered very nice presentation uh, excellent information you have given thank you very much now i request the uh, participants please you are uh, you can ask the questions dr chanchal you can see the chat box uh yes i can see i think yes i can see Oh, Nithya is there. Thank you, Nithya. Okay. One question is there in that. And in the chat box, question is, does food habit also play a role in spreading of the diseases? Uh, no. Uh, there is no such record that food habit uh, in any way predispose the disease. Uh, I think no. Okay. Any other participant? Yeah, another question is there. Yes, uh, room, actually uh, the favorable temperature for its growth is 28 to 30 degrees centigrade. That is the favorable temperature for the growth of the ramen. Only one exception is there, that is trichophyte and varicosum. The cattle species actually, sheep, goat, cattle, they prefer 37 degrees centigrade for their growth. They are asking about the incubation. So like other fungi, can we incubate the fungal culture of dermatophytes at room temperature? Yes, yes, I think I have cleared the point. Yeah. 
but that we are keeping uh, at room temperature for seven days, right? Yes. In, in the HDA plates and all. No, HDA actually for uh, isolation of dermatophytes, the culturing require uh, four, four weeks. Okay, okay. 28 days. 20. We, we start to get the growth uh, after uh, four or five uh, days, but we cannot exclude it until we uh, incubate uh, till uh, fourth week. 28 days. We cannot say no, uh, there is no uh, fungus. Yes, yes. Any other participants, please? Well, the important, very important information Dr. Chanchal, he has shared because I know that in, in India, very few laboratories are available and no one is, uh, is there to work on this, uh, although it's very risky. And I can say it's a neglected type of uh, this uh, genetic diseases or the, uh, the areas. But I got a chance with uh, to miss that's Dr. Chanchal. Uh, he also worked as a principal investigator in outreach program on genetic diseases, and I I was also uh, uh, with this uh, uh, in outreach program on genetic diseases. So very every year, whatever the information he has presented, very nice informations, and he has developed very uh, good laboratory for this. He is a very expert in that area. So definitely, uh, it's a very appreciable work he has uh, done during the last 10 to 12 years period. So I think no questions. Then uh, thank you once again, Dr. Chanchal, for wonderful information. And thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you. And speaker, Dr. Premanshu Dandapat sir, he is working as principal scientist. IVRI, uh, Eastern Region Center, uh, Kolkata. So before I request to uh, Dr. Dandapath, sir, I will give brief introduction about him. Dr. Dandapath is serving at Indian Veterinary Research Institute since 2010. At present, he is uh, working as principal scientist at the Eastern Region Station, uh, Indian Veterinary Research Institute, Kolkata. Uh, basic and applied research on animal diseases he has worked then especially zoonotic diseases prevalent in eastern and northern uh, east eastern part of india along with uh, referral diagnostic services and he has done research on bovine and zoonotic tuberculosis in collaboration with several national and international institutes uh, he has graduated uh, from the vidhan chandra krishi vishwavidyalaya west bengal India in, in the year 1995 with an MUSC in 1997 and PhD in 2002 from the Indian Veterinary Research Institute, Uttar Pradesh and MVM, MVM that is in biosecurity from Massey University, New Zealand. So, uh, sir has vast experience and he has extensive experience as a pathologist and and he is, uh, was uh, well executing formulation and implementation of national policies at the government of India level on control and containment of important animal diseases like uh, avian influenza, swine influenza, FMD, PPR, swine fever and brucellosis. He also uh, engaged in the strengthening of diagnostic network in the country through various central, regional and state level uh, disease diagnostic laboratories sir has handled a number of externally added projects including world bank uh, assisted project on preparedness control and containment of avian influenza and usaid funded fao led cross border project on avian influenza as a scheme officer also sir has worked under this outreach program on genetic diseases as a principal investigator and I was also part of that network project 
so uh, sir has vast experience many years sir has worked on different zoonotic diseases so with this few words uh, uh, i request dr premanshu dandapal sir to continue on his uh, talk that is uh, status of zoonotic tuberculosis in india and its concern in animal production and food safety dr dandapal sir please uh, thank you so much uh, dr bilas uh, um... Very good afternoon to everybody. Is my slides uh, are, audi are are visible? Is the slide visible? Just wait, sir. Your slides are not visible. Actually, I tried to share my slide, but it's too large. I cannot share it. Is it shared now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. You can, uh, yeah. PowerPoint mode. Yes. It's visible, no? Thank it's you. Visible. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I can't see anybody. So, it's very tough to interact with the participants from this uh, WebEx. I think more than 150 participants are present in this. So, the topic. Uh, which has been given to me the status of genotic tuberculosis in India and its concern in animal production and food safety. So already it's too late. So I'll just try to cover within 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. So coming to the outline, basically we'll just discuss about uh, the brief background about, about this bovine tuberculosis and the genotic tuberculosis in India. It's a recent scenario. What about the evidences and initiatives uh, has already been taken in India to control this particular tuberculosis? And what's the human TB status and the animal TB status in Indian context? What about the challenges in controlling it and what may be the alternate strategy? I'll not tell much about it, just to mention that it's so old disease. In India, it's reported uh, from today, it's more than 5,500 years ago. In different lit literatures, it has been mentioned. But the work on this tuberculosis, the research work was started way back, around uh, 100 years back, in 1923, by Dr. M. B. Soparka. He was basically a human physician, but he started work on this bovine tuberculosis in cattle at Mukteswar. So slowly, uh, from 1925 to 1967, the uh, different researchers, they concluded that probably Indian indigenous cattle are showing localized and very less progressive tuberculous lesions inside the body. And uh, the team of IVRA then started research on the susceptibility of the indigenous cattle, then diagnostic re reliability of the tuberculin test, which is still being used in India. And what about the different types of tubercle bacilli, which are circulating both in human and the animal population in India? Then few other research projects are also started uh, uh, since 1942. And then this, uh, this is a routine program is being conducted in India in the different sector. So uh, basically, uh, the old researchers, whatever they have done till now, even the invention or the production of uh, the tuberculin test or the tuberculin PPDs, still it is being used. And uh, there are total three hypothetical reasons of lower pre uh, incidence of bovine tuberculosis in India. It was explained that the natural resist resistance amongst indigenous cattle, then prevalence of low virulent tubercle bacilli, probably which is circulating in India, and rearing of cattle in the open air system, because that time mostly the organized farms were not that much established, but recently it's so many organized farms are in the different sectors. But all these things has been changing slowly. I, I'll just tell uh, how it's uh, how we are exploring and getting the real information on this tuberculosis in India. If you just have a look in this slide, the different people they have worked on the surveillance of bovine tuberculosis in the slaughtered animals. And you can see that the percent positivity, it's uh, starting from 0% to 60%. So it's very difficult to conclude because no uh, national surveillance program has been conducted yet in India. 
even the uh, testing or the screening of cattle by the different tests like tivaclin test or gamma interferon assay they told that yes still the prevalence is varying like anything lots of variations so recently in uh, uh, this paper has been published in 2018 they have done a meta analysis total eligible papers they have selected uh, 44 uh, by a penn state group basically and they have uh, analyzed all these data of more than 82,000 cattle and buffaloes across the country uh, in 18 states and one territory. And they concluded that the tuberculosis in animals, the prevalence is around 7.3%. And the, even if it is so less, 7%, 7 the estimates, it is estimated that 21.8 million cattle are affected by tuberculosis in India, which is more than five times than the total human cases of tuberculosis in our country. I have also done a small study in West Bengal and uh, to just obtain the uh, preliminary prevalence estimates. And when I screened more than uh, around 1800 cattle here in uh, eight, eight uh, different districts, I found that it is mostly concentrated in the organized farms and in organized farms, the prevalence is around 22%. So you can imagine that how many cattle in organized sectors are really rearing or uh, maybe having these particular organisms and they are trans transmitting within them. So coming to the range of the animal species affected, uh, all of us, we are knowing that uh, Mycobacterium bovis is having the highest range of the host, uh, including the human being. Uh, almost all the domesticated animals and the wild animals can be affected by Mycobacterium bovis. Even Mycobacterium tuberculosis has also been reported from a, a good number of animal species. Then recently, uh, the, maybe in 2010 onwards, we have found that this MTBC, what earlier we have studied, I don't know, uh, maybe the very young uh, people are also attending it, but uh, I'm talking about when I have done my BBSC and AH in way back in 1990 to 1995, that time we we are taught that Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex are having four organisms: Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Mycobacterium bovis, Mycobacterium africanum, and Microti, which is Volbacillus. But now the scenario has been changed. Now, as per the recent status, the total Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex species can be categorized into three groups. One group is strictly human pathogen, but it is all are having the genotic importance. Any any of these organisms can also infect the animals strict human animal adapted mtbc and the mycobacterium canati now mycobacterium tuberculosis and africanum these are basically human pathogens mostly infect the humans but animal adapted pathogens are it's a long list micro t pinipedi oryges mungai saricate bovis and caffrey and these are basically whenever they were isolated first time from that particular species of animals, the, uh, the nomenclature was uh, that time formulated in that way. Canity is basically concentrated only in the, only in the Horn of Africa. And still it is presumed that it has, it has been evoluted from the animal species and now it is only concentrated in that particular area. So these are the basically the different lineages of Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. All of them can cause tuberculosis, which can form that nodular lesions in the lung, limb nodes, and the other organs of the body. So this is uh, basically uh, mainly categorized. All the lineages and the speciation has been done on the recent nomenclature based on the different region of difference, that is RD in short form. Coming to the transmission, you see, uh, uh, if I'll talk about the Mycobacterium bovis, that it can mostly transmit from cattle to cattle or the animals to animals, but it can also transmit the human being. Once the human being is affected by any species of animal origin, from human to human can again be transmitted. Most of the animals are basically the spillover host uh, and they, uh, they do not maintain this Mycobacterium bovis and cattle are mainly the reservoir of it. It can be transmitted through aerosol, maybe through ingestion, through cutaneous or the genital contacts and even some asymptomatic carrier can also occur. I already mentioned the ingestion, respiratory, bite scratch, inhalation. These are the main routes basically for 
transmission of tuberculosis in all the uh, animals uh, across all the species. When we'll talk about the human being, uh, for the genotic tuberculosis, it's mostly transmitted through the ingestion. And earlier, when the pasteurization was not uh, followed, strictly followed in most of the uh, animal pro uh, uh, this production system, that time it used to be transmitted through uh, the ingestion, through the oral route, and the, all the uh, extra pulmonary lesions used to be happen. But Mycobacterium bovis or any species of this Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex of animal origin, they can very well uh, make the infections in the lung also. Now, coming to the genotic species, uh, earlier we used to think that uh, probably in India, lots of Mycobacterium bovis cases are there. I don't know how many of you have already uh, uh, have uh, done some research on this uh, tuberculosis. Even during my master's, I have uh, done my research on uh, bovine tuberculosis at Central Jalma Institute for Leprosy. And when I started work again here, I found that lots of bovises are there because I have misdiagnosed most of the species as bovis because the, all the PCR, that polymerase chain reactions available, the, mostly the conventional PCRs, even the cultural characteristics and the biochemical characteristics, all are almost similar in case of Mycobacterium bovis, origis, and Capri. So when I have done even my isolates, uh, I characterized the isolates through whole genome sequencing, I found I have misdiagnosed the species as Mycobacterium bovis. All of them, either Mycobacterium origis or Mycobacterium capri. None of them is Mycobacterium bovis. So I am sure, uh, even in this paper, I am also the co-author of this uh, genotic TB paper published in Lancet Microbe. We found, we basically screened 940 human isolates of Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, and we have uh, uh, screened all these uh, isolates by the whole genome sequence, and when we characterized, we found that uh, Mycobacterium origis is 0.7 percent. Rest are mostly the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, few of them Mycobacterium bovis BCG, because BCG is a vaccine strain, but sometimes in the immunosuppressed cases, they can cause human tuberculosis, and few of them are non-tuberculous mycobacteria. But we didn't found any Mycobacterium bovis even in the uh, in the human population. So when we just try to analyze all these isolates, uh, because from cattle also I have uh, uh, whole, means whole genome sequence data of 19 isolates are available in the database of NCBI. So when we analyzed it, we found that Mycobacterium origis, the strains are almost similar. The same kind of strains are circulating both in human as well as animals. So this is concluded that probably Mycobacterium bovis was a proxy and uh, we are getting lots of origins. And as I shown you, or again, I will uh, show you, maybe in the previous picture, I will just want to show you. Here you can see Mycobacterium. It links uh, can you see it? All the participants, please mute your mic. Don't talk in between. Participants, you are requested to please mute your mic. So you can see that uh, it is th it is thought that probably the ancient strain of MTBC is Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and slowly after mutations, all the animal adopted strains came, and lastly this Mycobacterium bovis. And you can see before Mycobacterium bovis is Mycobacterium <laughs> capri. And uh, Above this capri is the origis. So Mycobacterium origis is just in between Mycobacterium tuberculosis and bovis. So this is having much more capability to infect human being. So what we thought earlier that probably bovis is having the lots of genotic importance, but definitely capri and origis will have uh, lots of genotic importance here. Here the uh,
the the diseases in case of the cattle the clinical signs it's very difficult to uh, notice because mostly in the advanced stages you can find the clinical signs early stage mostly the cattle are asymptomatic although they can transmit uh, the disease to the neighboring cattle or the other animals even the human being but in the in the late stage in the organized farm you can see some of the cattle are having progressive emaciation they are having fever weakness in appetence sometimes moist calf you can also see and the uh, limb nodes sometimes uh, uh, in the superficial limb nodes mostly the prescapular and other limb nodes they usually uh, burst and uh, uh, through that basically the organisms can also be transmitted if uh, you will just have a look about this immune response to this bovine tuberculosis uh, here you can see that antibody used to be raised later on after 3 months onwards but cell mediated immunity can be detected early uh, in, uh, i mean maybe after one month uh, of the infection and that can be detected by tuberculin test or by gamma interferon assay so the laboratory diagnosis can be done uh, both in anti mortem as well as the post mortem in the in case of the anti mortem means the in the live animals we usually do the tuberculin test or the gamma interferon assay but in case of the post mortem we do uh, directly we can detect the organisms through uh, pcr or by culture so this is uh, recently published uh, by oie uh, now the oie name has also been changed it is now waoh that is world organization of animal health and uh, uh, the bovine tuberculosis chapter has also been renamed as mammalian tuberculosis now different kinds of tests which are uh, present uh, for the detection of agent or the detection of immune response for the detection of immune response you can see the delayed hypersensitivity skin test or the uh, interferon gamma release assay or maybe the antibody can be detected by elisa or the lateral flow assay but for the detection of antigens we usually do the acid first scanning then the bacterial isolation sometimes histopathology and de detection of antigen or the real time pcr or the different conventional pcr now what for we are doing these kind of tests you can see the the, the purposes basically whether uh, some countries are trying to uh, make the freedom from the infection or the individual animal freedom from the infection prior to movement whether we are going to eradicate uh, uh, some uh, some uh, database uh, to contribute to the to uh, frame out the eradication policy or the confirmation of the clinical cases for us basically confirmation of the clinical cases are very much important here you can see and acid first staining or the bacterial isolation and even the pcr they are basically we can confirm it through this but delayed type hypersensitivity test which we used to do by the tuberculin test is also very much important to screen it uh, in the in the live animals in the farms or the unorganized sector so coming to the uh, the tuberculin test you can see this is uh, we can do it by the caudal fold or the comparative cervical or the single cervical the single cervical we usually use and this is uh, the recommended test at uh, india in india uh, basically we used to inoculate the bovine ppd and uh, if the skin thickness is uh, increasing uh, more than 4 mm we are uh, concluding them as a tb positive but in india we are having lots of non tuberculous mycobacteria both in environment as well as in the animal population even we are having the lots of para tuberculosis cases as the antigenic mass or the antigenic epitopes are quite similar with antm and the mtbc so usually we used to get lots of false positive reaction so it is recommended to perform the comparative tuberculin test or the comparative cervical test i am not going in detail about it everything is written in that in that chapter try to follow it the difference of the skin thickness if it is more than 4 mm then it is positive if it is 2 to 4 then it is doubtful those animals can be retested after 8 weeks of the uh, first testing and if it is less than 2 mm then it is negative caudal fold test we are not following it's mostly followed in the european countries second one is the gamma interferon test it's it's also measuring the cell mediated immunity but in vitro not in vivo because if you are testing the animal today by tuberculin test you cannot retest the animals within 8 weeks time you have to retest it after 
eight weeks because the animals will be sensitized by the PPDs. But in case of the gamma interferon assay, you can retest, this, retest the animal on the next very day because you are taking the blood out and uh, giving the stimulation. And the, if the animal is positive, lots of gamma interferon will be released. And those gamma interferon, we used to measure it by the ELISA. But problem is that because the 1800 animals, what I have performed, I have screened most of the animals both by CTT, that is cervical tuberculin test and the gamma interferon assay. And I found that some of the animals are really positive by both, some are negative by both, but there are few animals which are positive by gamma interferon but negative by uh, CTT and vice versa. So why it's happening like this? We have tried to uh, explore uh, and we hypothesize that current available international gamma interferon tests are not standardized in Indian condition, maybe. There are differences in potencies of the PPDs which are being used both in Tivaclin and the gamma interferon test. And there are differences in environmental microbacteria exposure that result in indis uh, indiscipline uh, skin induration versus blood recall response in exposed cattle. Also, we tried to examine what are the different risk factors. One is one uh, most important risk factors. If the animals are aged, we are getting uh, the, the chances of getting positive for TB is higher. Uh, this is the only thing. Otherwise, the sex, uh, there is no relation. Um, so male, female, both can be uh, affected. Even within breeds, yes, the exotic animals uh, uh, populations uh, are having the higher prevalence. Um, but I don't know what we have, what I have told you in the beginning of my slides presentation that uh, the, uh, earlier the, uh, the researchers saw, thought that the indigenous cattle are basically uh, probably uh, much more resistant to tuberculosis. But uh, whatever we are getting, it's not like that. Both indigenous and exotic can be equally affected. So uh, coming to the gross lesions, uh, all of you are knowing that uh, these are the different uh, lung samples uh, and the limb node samples, uh, what I have collected from the slaughterhouse. Sometimes you can see the miliary tuberculosis. Sometimes the nodules may be quite larger. Appearance is uh, uh, sometimes yellowish or the whitish. The KGS mass will be there. The calcified lesions, uh, uh, if it is uh, chronic in nature, and uh, it sometimes resembles with the abscess. So don't be confused with the abscess. Just after giving the incision, you will be very well see the uh, classical tuberculous nodules in the lung or the limb nodes or the other organs also. Uh, we have also performed some of the postmortem in deer, and in deer, uh, it uh, usually from the disseminated form of tuberculosis, mostly all the organs used to be affected by tuberculosis. So uh, the protocol or the SOP, standard operating procedure, what uh, uh, we are using, uh, uh, basically after getting the slaughterhouse samples, uh, it's we are dividing it into three parts. One is going for the acid first staining. Second part we are using for the cultural isolation, and third part for the isolation of DNA for direct screening by PCR. Then the different kinds of uh, even after isolation we used to go by the acid acid first stains, and even we used to isolate the DNA and the different PCRs we used to do. So I'll just show you. Uh, this is another, uh, uh, just from the direct smear, you can see this kind of acid first bacilli, uh, even direct uh, smear of the lung or the limb node samples. After cultural isolation, you can see uh, the growth if it is uh, MTBC. Uh, sometimes uh, 6 to 16 weeks, maybe four, after 4 months even I found the colonies are coming up. So uh, it's very difficult to isolate and it's, it's really very time consuming to get the isolates of all these MTBC. Then the media is also, uh, uh, glycerol is usually used or promote the growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis and pyruvate promote the growth of mycobacterium bovis or the other MTBC of animal origin species. So for the PCR, I'll just show you a few pictures. Uh, first, we have to find out whether the bacterial isolate is mycobacteria or not. So mycobacteria can be detected by two uh, important genes. One is the HSP65 gene. If it is mycobacteria, it will clear cut see the band. Or the 16S ribosomal RNA. These are the two specific and uh, world, uh, globally recommended uh, 
regions which are used for detection of mycobacterium species. And once it is confirmed as mycobacterium species, we used to confirm it whether it is mycobacterium tuberculosis complex or not, based on the MPV70 gene. Once it's confirmed, then we used to find out whether it is of animal origin or human origin based on the RD9. RD9 positive in case of the MTBC of human origin like mycobacterium tuberculosis. But it's absent in origis, capri, bovis or the rest uh, MTBC of animal origin. Earlier, why I used to be confused, it was published and mostly in India, most of the laboratories they are following that 500 BP fragment, it's, it is present only in mycobacterium bovis, but it's not like that. It's also present in origis and capri. So we used to misdiagnose it. Now, recently, uh, we have adopted the real-time PCR, and uh, through this, the speciation can be done very well, uh, whether which particular species of this MTBC it is, it can be done very well. If anybody want to standardize it, uh, you can also contact me, I can guide you for that. Recently, in most of the laboratories, we don't have the real-time PCR. Even most of the human diagnostic lab, they are not having the real-time PCR. So what to do? We have to develop some a multiplex PCR, which is conventional in nature. And recently, I'm, I'm very happy to say that we have developed one multiplex PCR, which can also differentiate all the different species of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, including Capri and Origis. And it's under validation. Once it's validated, then uh, uh, it can also be published or can be patented. So this is the real-time uh, picture I'm just trying to show you. Based on this, uh, it can be also diagnosed. So these are the different uh, strains uh, or the lineages of uh, MTBC, what I have already shown to you. And uh, this particular uh, uh, thing we have published in the Lancet. So uh, evidences and the initiatives on control of tuberculosis, uh, there are lots of plan has been made long back. Uh, uh, but uh, in 1962, the ICR proposed that uh, we can phase-wise control it in the different phases it was devised, but ultimately it was not followed properly. If you just think of the human and animal tuberculosis in Indian context, the initiative towards prevention and control of human TB in India, it started almost in the same period when we started in animals, but the animal TB was completely neglected. So first TB dispensary, it was established in 1917, uh, for the human being in at Chennai, then human TB, uh, basically it was tackled in an organized way. Then the vaccine was developed. Uh, then the different uh, nationwide TB control programs uh, were also drafted and implemented, like N NTCP or the uh, conventional chemotherapy. Then later on the short course chemotherapy. Then the DOTS therapy has come. And slowly the cases has been reduced drastically. But due to COVID, again, lots of uh, transmission of this human tuberculosis happened within the animals. So what may be the probable, uh, because you see the genotic tuberculosis, what we have uh, discussed, and even in my topic, it is like that. But uh, I just want to tell you that this bacteria can very well uh, uh, killed or maybe desensitized at uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Even at 72 degrees Celsius, uh, if you can just... Uh, uh, pasteurize it for a longer period of time, uh, it can also be killed, but pasteurization can inactivate. I should not say that it will completely kill because I have, after pasteurization, I just tried to isolate the uh, mRNA and I found that it's intact. So it is, in, uh, means it, it may not be killed, but that organism will not cause any disease, so we'll be safe. So uh, through the food, basically, uh, the problem is that uh, sometimes the unpasteurized milks are used for uh, preparation of some of the food products like cheese. Sometimes the fat layer we used to remove uh, to prepare the ice cream and so many other things. And all these cheese, paneer, or maybe the ice creams, all are maintaining, we are maintaining the cold chain uh, from the manufacturing unit to the consumer's uh, uh, door. So basically, as we are maintaining the cold chain, this tubercle bacilli can be completely alive and it can also be transmitted. So uh, definitely cheese, sometimes we are taking uh, without hitting it, if it's not in uh, pizza or something we are preparing. But uh, ice cream also, we can't uh, uh, heat it and consume. 
so basically these are the probable source for transmission of zoonotic TB from animals to human. Uh, so the screening of animals and the uh, certification of the herd free from TB is really very much important uh, for production and selling of this kind of product from the organized herds. So challenges are basically we really don't know still that what's the real magnitude of infection, although this meta-analysis is saying that uh, 7% uh, around population are affected by TB. Uh, when I am going to the farms or the unorganized sector, the people are really uh, not allowing to screen because they are thinking once the farm will be declared as TB positive farm, they will be in trouble. So the awareness amongst the farmers or the animal owners is very much important. We don't have the proper diagnostics in our country. So for the research purpose, I'm procuring and it's so costly even to screen 400 animals by gamma interferon as a kit, the kit is uh, costing around 3.5 lakhs. In India, we are only producing bovine tuber clean, which is uh, uh, IVRA is the only producer. We don't have the avian PPD in our country, so even we can't do the comparative tuber clean test. We also don't uh, have the IGRA of our ind indigenous, uh, uh, means nobody has developed it yet in India, so we are procuring. So lots of diagnostics are really re required. Now you see, in our country, I'll just come uh, at the last uh, point that what are the different control strategies which can be adopted. One of them is the vaccination strategy because the European or the American countries, even in Australia and New Zealand, they have uh, controlled or eradicated the disease through test and slaughter policy. In our country, it's almost impossible. Even we, uh, due to some religious reason, we can't slaughter it. And moreover, uh, the giving compensation, it's a huge task because we are having lots of TB positive animals. It's almost impossible. So the most probable strategy is the vaccination. So if we are going to vaccinate the animals, again, the animals will be tested positive by TB clean test or the gamma interferon assay. So we have to develop some diva, diva strategy based on some biomarkers. So in our uh, one of my project uh, uh, in the Bill Gates Foundation, so we have developed one DIVA test, but still uh, those uh, antigens have, has to be screened a lot uh, to find out its sensitivity and specificity. We are having lots of wild animals, uh, even in the wild animals like deer and bison, even in elephants, lots of TB cases are there. So even if we'll control it in domestic animal, again, it can come through the interface uh, of wild and the animal and the uh, domestic animals. I already mentioned test slaughter policy is almost impossible and uh, zoonosis and reverse zoonosis, uh, it's really very important. We have to make uh, some strong database to take some strategic actions on that. So the alternate strategy is the only vaccination, uh, vaccination and the vaccination. There is no other alternative, I think, for India. And uh, BCG, uh, what we are using, the same strain can also be used. Uh, but we have to make lots of trial. Already the BCG vaccine trial has been done in cattle at Tanuvas and buffalo at uh, Luvas. Uh, treatment is, uh, is an option, but uh, the cost of treatment will be a few times more than the cost of the animal. But yes, for the endangered animals like lion, like tiger or so many other endangered animals, the treatment can be done. I have done a very small study on uh, uh, MTBC strains here, and I found most of the strains are resistant to micro uh, the, the streptomycin, and very few are uh, resistant to isoniazide or epampicin. Only one strain I found MDR. Uh, so treatment uh, sometimes it's cost effective. Uh, our strain means Mycobacterium bovis, but now we are not getting bovis. Uh, bovis is pyrazinamide resistant, so that drug cannot be used. And uh, so we have to explore some alternate medicines like homeopath or maybe Ayurvedic medicines because if we can find out some of the plants, uh, bark or maybe leaves are really uh, having some antitubercular effect. So those can also be used at least to treat the animal, to reduce the load or to cure the animals. We do have the clear-cut provisions of law that is Prevention and Control of Infection and Contagious Diseases in Animals Act 2009. So using this particular uh, law, even we can go inside to any farm and we can screen them and we can control or we can make our database to help the administrators and politicians to develop the policy for control and content this bovine tuberculosis along with the human tuberculosis. 
So in conclusion, I just want to mention that uh, we do require the holistic approach, even not only the controlling TB in animals or the, or the domestic animals, but also in the wildlife sector and also the genotic TB uh, uh, in human beings. We have to do a lot, do lot of uh, research on the epidemiological aspects, mostly on the risk factor analysis. We have to make the farmers and the farm owners aware about this bovine tuberculosis, why it is important, because they cannot uh, uh, see uh, like the chronic, the acute diseases like HS, anthrax, or even the LSD. So we have to make them aware that why it is very much important. We have to coordinate all the stakeholders. We have to make the planning at the national level. Then only we'll be able to control and contain it in the farm level. This is my institute at Kolkata. It's a very small institute. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you very much, sir, for excellent presentation on this important topic you have presented here. Uh, all the aspects of, because I know that you are a uh, uh, well uh, experienced person and you have worked starting from your master's program. You have worked on tuberculosis even in outreach program on zoonotic diseases. You have uh, worked and uh, every year you have presented very wonderful information. So in your talk, all the aspects of this tuberculosis which is required in now, this is an important topic because it is very relevant and recent information you have presented, whatever the status of genetic tuberculosis in India that you have mentioned and in uh, with respect to animal production and food safety, what precautionary measures we should take and what uh, the about the, what are the different challenges with respect to the genotic tuberculosis and control strategies, what needs uh, that we require different uh, diagnostic measures, then what the, we, we have to be very much aware about the vaccines and then collaborations at national as well as international approach you have mentioned and the holistic approach is needed that all the aspects you have very nicely covered. Uh, thanks a lot, sir, for although you are very much busy, but as you have accepted our invitations and you have presented very wonderful uh, your presentation. Now I request the participants, please two, three questions, please. Either I can't be able to tell properly or <laughs> I have covered everything. So no question. Yes, you have covered, sir. Good sir. Doctor, sir. One question is there. Uh, what? I'm sorry. Can you repeat, please? Uh, yes, Doctor Rahul. You can continue. Please suggest. Short field level, it is available or. Sorry, Doc Sab, I can't hear your voice. It's interrupted. Can you repeat, please? Again, one. Again, you can ask the question. It's not clear. Can you write in the chat box? One question is there, why adulthood BCG vaccination is not done in human being? You see, uh, adulthood vaccination mostly uh, it's not followed because uh, the giving the booster, childhood vaccination, uh, mostly uh, what we used to give, even it cannot protect 100%. In human being, it's already published that uh, around 45 to 50 percent human being give the 100 percent protection 20 to 30 percent give the partial protection 10 percent even after taking the vaccine they don't get any protection and 10 percent human being are already resistant means uh, sometimes they don't uh, get the tb uh, even after giving the booster uh, at adulthood uh, 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 nobody has published that kind of literature but uh, i have seen one or two publications long back that after giving the booster even uh, they are not getting uh, much uh, impact on that uh, the immunity is almost same and moreover the country like india uh, amongst out of three uh, people 
one of us is either infected or we are carrying the organism. So all the time we are getting exposure uh, to tubercle bacilli if we are going out from our home. So already we are getting some, uh, some kind of natural booster, I think so. Uh, but yes, uh, your question is very relevant and uh, uh, still the information I have not uh, gone through. Uh, but uh, we can also raise this point where whether this adulthood vaccinations, uh, maybe some pilot study can be done in India or not. But in animals, uh, we have already studied in Ethiopia, our group basically, they have done this BCG vaccination in Ethiopia. And we are getting a very promising uh, output. Uh, what I mentioned, 30 percent uh, in case of human being 45, but in case of cattle, we are getting 30 percent uh, cattle are giving almost 100 percent protection after giving the booster dose after one year. Uh, even the infected animals, they have reduced the excretion of uh, tubercle bacilli through their nasal and the buccal route. So that is a very important point. In their lifetime, maybe one cattle is transmitting to 15 or 20 animals in the farm. Uh, but if you give the vaccine to those infected animals, sometimes it can be reduced and it can transmit to one, two or up to five animals. So if we can get that kind of results, it's really very good for us. I think Dr. Raul was asking some question. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. I think there may be a network issue. Dr. Rahul? Sir, uh, I want to ask that any test for diagnosis of tuberculosis at field level, any kit is available? I already mentioned, you see, for the live animals, for the live animals, we in India, government of India has recommended only the tuberculin test because in India, we are producing bovine PPD and it's being produced at IVRI. So tuberculin test means only one tuberculin, 0.1 ml, you have to inject intradermally from the neck, from the crest of the neck, 10 centimeters in the middle third of the neck, you have to inject intradermally and after 72 hours, you have to Again, take the reading. If it is more than 4 millimeter, then the animal is tuberculosis positive. We used to uh, give the diagnosis like this. But what I mentioned that in our country, we are having lots of paratuberculosis cases or we are having lots of NTMs like my mycobacterium fortuitum, mycobacterium uh, abscessus, lots of uh, uh, genotic, even these are genotic, uh, it's circulating. So animals are getting exposed to it. So sometimes we may get false positive. So for that, comparative tuberculin test is mostly used, which can tell you whether it is exactly TB or it's the NTM exposure. But that kit, uh, earlier it was produced by Prionics. Now Prionics has been purchased by Thermo Fisher. So Thermo Fisher is selling that kit. Another kit is the gamma interferon test. That kit is also available uh, abroad. So we have to import that kit. In India, we don't have. If the animals are dying, then the tissue samples you can collect. If you can do PCR, uh, it's well, very well. Otherwise, even you can send the sample. I don't know where from you are. You can also send the samples to me. And uh, within 15 to 20 days, I'll be giving you the conclusive diagnosis for that. One more question is there. Yeah, which type of TB generally found in bovine, likewise intestine, lung, and brain? You see, for animal, we have nobody has done that kind of systematic study, but 90% uh, TB are mostly seen in lung. But recently, we have done a small study in the slaughterhouse. We are getting even in the lung, the lesions will come later on. First, the lesions used to come in the limb nodes limb nodes associated with the lung. It may be bronchial, it may be retropharyngeal. So those kind of limb nodes, we are getting lesions. But definitely it can also uh, infect when it's in the advanced stage, it can be disseminated to any organ, even intestine, kidney, liver, spleen, everywhere we used to see. Even sometimes in the reef cages, lots of nodules used to be seen. Uh, 
so which type of tb generally found in it's a mostly pulmonary tb very few extra pulmonary tb i think i cleared your question dr prasant Uh, yeah, Dr. Prashant, he is satisfied, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So now I think no questions. Uh, uh, I think all of uh, all the participants are. Uh, uh, I don't know what's the background. Uh, they are all veterinarians or uh, medicals. Yeah, yeah. yeah, some are medicals also, but most of them are veterinarians. They okay. are faculties, then uh, in ICR institutes also some are scientists. Okay. And PhD students are also there, sir. Good. Yeah, industry personnel are also there. So, once again, I thanks, uh, thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot. Because thank I, you so I, much. Yeah, you, you so. worked with Dr. Vivek Kapoor, sir, also. Uh, that Penn State Laboratory, uh, that Penn State uh, Miss University, USA. So many a times you are in the discussion every week. There is a meeting, and uh, yes, as yes. you are, yeah, expertise. So thanks a lot, sir. Once again, thank you so much. Yeah, for your experience, very nice, uh, very wonderful and excellent talk. Thank you once again. Yeah. Uh, now for tomorrow's uh, session, we'll have two email. Speakers, Dr. M. L. Gutnesser. He is uh, now former professor and head, uh, Department of Parasitology, Mumbai Veterinary College. And sir will present his talk uh, talk on zoonotic importance of echinococcus and its economic impact. And another eminent speaker, Dr. B. D. Sharma. He is also retired principal scientist and head, Division of Livestock Production Technology, ICR Iwara Ijatnagar. And uh, sir will present his topic on sensory evaluation of livestock products. So all the both are very interesting and important topics. So all participants are requested to be uh, missed to attend every day. All these lectures are very important. And I, I earlier mentioned more than 80 percent attendance is required to get the certificate. So every day you should be there. And to attend the just you have to at the end you have to fill up the post evaluation pro forma. Okay, so uh, thank you once again to all of you. Huh?